In 2013, feminist author and activist Cynthia Enlow published a book that she entitled Seriously, Investigating Crises and Crashes as If Women Mattered. In it, she addressed two really important questions that relate to gender and to women. Who is taken seriously? And who gets to bestow the label of serious on others? Enlo looked into our contemporary world, into the economy, banking and finance, military operations, and the role of women in revolution and reform. In each case study, she examined the voices of women who were intellectuals, activists, and professionals, and demonstrated how progress was impeded by the fact that their voices were ignored or dismissed. Enlo's questions, who is taken seriously and who gets to decide what is serious, are at the heart of what I wish to share with you today, which is my research into why it has been so hard to learn about women in ancient Israel and also into what we can do about it. I would like to explore the ways in which traditional scholarship in the fields of archaeology and biblical studies has hampered our study of women's lives in ancient Israel. To do this, we will briefly consider the fields of biblical studies and archaeology, and then look at women in fieldwork, publications, professional societies, and of course, employment. As I see it, none of these topics are distinct. Rather, as I hope to persuade you today, they are interrelated subjects that impede our exploration of women in biblical antiquity. Our focus today is Israel in the Iron Age, the core biblical period 1200 to 587 BCE, and women's lives in that crucial era. When you consider that the extensive and partly um, contemporaneous text, that is the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, and the richness of Israel's archaeological record, you might imagine that scholars seeking to reconstruct the lives of women in Iron Age Israel would find themselves in a virtual paradise, or perhaps more appropriately, in a Garden of Eden. So it is surprising to discover that this is not always the case. In some ways, the quantity of material with which scholars can work offers an embarrassment of riches. The Hebrew Bible, with a word count totaling 305,497, thank you, David Noel Friedman, is the lengthiest and best preserved document from Near Eastern antiquity. Of course, its spiritual core, the Torah or Pentateuch, that is, the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, was not complete until the mid-5th century BCE, almost a century into the Persian period, and its compilation into a single document took place in the Roman era. Even so, the Hebrew Bible contains material that dates to the Iron Age. Royal court records, law codes, folk narratives, foundational tales, histories, etiologies, genealogies, territorial lists, prophetic sagas, poetry, psalms, and proverbs are all valuable witnesses to that era. Some of this material pertains specifically to women. The Hebrew Bible names 1,426 individuals, of whom 111, such as Sarah and Hagar, are women. Hundreds of other women mentioned either as individuals, such as the wife of Noah, or collectively, such as the women at Sinai, remain nameless. The land of Israel is the world's most thoroughly excavated. This includes, most obviously, work at Israel's many tells, the great mounds that are its most visible type of archaeological site. Remains from the Iron Age I, the period of Israelite settlement, 1200 to 1000 BCE, have been identified at more than 250 small non-tell sites in the central highlands alone. Remains from the Iron Age II, the era of the Israelite monarchy, 1000 to 587 BCE, have been excavated at some 300 sites throughout Israel and Judah. Surveys have identified nearly 600 sites just from 7th century Judah. 
Most significant for the study of Israelite women is the fact that more than 200 Iron Age houses have been excavated. Promising as this sounds for the study of women, we must remember that overall, the focus in ancient Near Eastern studies has been on discovering and translating texts and on reconstructing historical events. Monumental architecture, whether royal or sacred, is physically prominent and has tantalized archaeologists with its potential for artifactual and textual rewards. One consequence of this has been the neglect of domestic archaeology, the archaeology of the house and the housing compound, and this really matters because it was in precisely these settings that tangible traces of women can be found. This is not meant to diminish women's accomplishments. Rather, it acknowledges that in ancient Israel, most people's lives were focused on the sustenance of the domestic unit and driven by the exig exigencies of Israel's subsistence economy. This may seem obvious, but until at least until the last few decades, domestic life and household archaeology were not considered topics worthy of serious study. I attribute this in no small measure to issues of gender and class among archaeologists. When men from society's elite dominated archaeology, relegating their domestic concerns to their wives and household staffs, any archaeological engagement with daily life remained the byproduct of chance discoveries in the field. To understand why, let's begin with the history of exploration. The Ottoman Empire of the 19th and early 20th centuries provides the backdrop for our overview. In that era, Europeans and Americans, almost exclusively Protestant men, university or seminary educated, entered Egypt and the Middle East as explorers, diplomats, military men, businessmen, and clergy. For many, the lure was the, the lure was the Middle East as what they called the land of the Bible. That is the backdrop for their own Christian beliefs. Sites from Egypt to Iraq were explored and spectacular finds made their way to the great universities and museums of Europe and the United States. Thanks to their hard work, the field of Middle Eastern archeology span began to develop. So how did women first engage in the field of archeology? span Although many women came to the Middle East as the wives of men serving in commercial, diplomatic, or clerical posts, a few were entrepreneurs, diplomats, travelers, or pilgrims in their own right. Probably the best known is Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell, CBE, an Oxford-educated scholar. Bell is renowned for her extensive travels in Egypt and the Middle East, her phenomenal language skills, her many publications, her work for the British government and with <coughs> Arab leaders at the Intelligence Bureau for Arab Affairs in Cairo and at the British Arab Bureau in Baghdad. Um, she's known also for her role in the creation of Iraq and her collaboration with T.E. Lawrence of Arabia. Less well known is her work as a field archeologist in Turkey, Syria, and Iraq as director of the Department of Antiquities in Iraq and as founder and director of the Iraq Museum. And recently she was portrayed by Nicole Kidman in a movie that you know, was out on the big screen. I didn't see it yet, but some of you may have. The pioneer female archeologists of Israel and Jordan, whose work is important for reconstructing Iron Age Israel, are less well known. I have time to mention only two, one British and one Israeli. Dame Kathleen Kenyon, CBE, the daughter of eminent British, British archeologist Sir Frederick Kenyon, earned her bachelor's degree at Oxford. Her archeological contributions included groundbreaking work at Samaria and the directorship of excavations at Jericho and in Jerusalem. She headed the British School of Archeology span in Jerusalem recently renamed the Kenyan Institute, and she was instrumental in founding the British Institute for History and Archaeology in Amman. Back home, Kenyon taught at both the Institute of Archaeology at London University 
and at St. Hugh's College at Oxford. And the photo on the right, which shows her with several American archaeologists, including, I believe, Deaver, at her excavation, I mean, you can tell that's, that's Jerusalem. I put here because I want you to have a sense of who her colleagues were. This was a man's world. And you'll see the same in the next image that I'm going to show you, the next person I'm going to talk about. Our late friend and colleague, Trudy Krakauer Dotan, moved with her family from Vienna to Palestine when she was quite young. She's actually very cagey about her age, and so you can find a number of options for her birth year and so forth, but I think I have it approximately right. In the mid-1940s, Trudy began her studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Between 1948 and 1950, she left school to serve in the mapping and photography division of the Israel Defense Forces. She received her master's from Hebrew University in 1950 and her doctorate in 1961, and then taught at Hebrew University until her retirement. Um, Trudy began her field work at Hatzor, and that's the picture that I'm showing you. You can see her fourth from your right in the bottom row. Um, and again, you have a sense of what these digs look like and felt like. This is Israeli archaeology in the 1950s. Um, didn't change much fast. So she then went on to co-direct the excavation of two major sites in Israel, Ein Gedi and Tel Mikne Ekron. In addition, she co-directed the first Israeli-led expedition to take place outside of Israel at Athenu in Cyprus, and she directed a major dig in Gaza at Deir el Balah. Like the many men with whom they worked, these women were pioneers in Near Eastern archaeology. They came from successful families, they were well-educated, and they had the kind of confident and decisive personalities that enabled them to thrive in a male-dominated world. Their impact is unquestionably positive. Even more so, um, even so, in her recent study of British women who worked in Near Eastern archaeology, Sarah Champion demonstrated that their impact, the impact of these um, female archaeologists, has been accorded less weight than that of their male colleagues. As Champion described it, visible then, invisible now. And here are some great sites you can go to, and I'm happy to give any of you the information later on if you want. If you're interested in learning more about female archaeologists, Trowel Blazers is more general. The Brown site focuses more on the Near Eastern world. There are both repositories of all kinds of interesting and fabulous information. The contributions of women who married archaeologists and supported their husbands in the field is insufficiently explored, but also important. Some, like Dame Agatha Marie Clarissa Christie, Nay Miller, DME, joined her husband in the field, joined their husbands in the field, even before she met her second husband, Sir Max Malawan a renowned British archaeologist who excavated extensively in Syria and Iraq and who directed the British School of Archaeology in Iraq, Dame Agatha had already spent time in Egypt. A famous author, when they first married, Christ Christie not only helped fund Malawan's excavations, but also joined him in the field each season, working as dig art photographer, artifact conservator, and registrar. She's, and here you can see them in the field down in the bottom left. She set one of her books, Murder in Mesopotamia, on an excavation site in Iraq and had Belgian detective Hercule Poirot solve a murder there. Her autobiography, entitled Come Tell Me How You Live, reflects on their travels and field work in Syria. According to Sir Max, Dame Agatha once said, an archaeologist is the best husband a woman can have. The older she gets, the more interested he is in her. <laughs> that statement actually is 
all over the place. Everybody accepts it as gospel truth. We can't, nobody has been able to find that original quote, but that's what Sir Max says about her. And there's also an anecdote that says when people asked her, ooh, didn't you find it horrible going out in the field and digging up skeletons? She responded approximately, are you kidding? That's what I love to do. <laughs> so closer to home is Norma Spangler Deaver the first wife of JUS Prof Judaic Studies Professor Emeritus William G. Deaver. Bill is the preeminent biblical archeologist of our times, and Norma is, without question, archeology's span preeminent dig wife. Some years ago, I encouraged her to publish an article documenting the contributions of archeological wives to their husband's fieldwork projects. And here in the center, you can see a piece of it, the article called They Also Dug, Archeologists' Wives and Their um, Stories. And if you can read the, the first quote, one of these archeologists said, what we all need most, what we need most of all is a wife. What about me? <laughs> Right. Anyhow, as Norma pointed out in that article, some women chose not to participate in their husband's field projects, but others made innumerable contributions to their husband's success. Norma assisted Bill both in the field and in the long off seasons. A teacher, she supported Bill while he pursued his PhD at Harvard, as well as helping with his doctoral research and typing his dissertation. She traveled with him throughout the Middle East and moved with him to Jerusalem where their son Sean was born. Norma ran the camps at Bill's dig sites of Tel Gezer and Tel Be for, um, more, and Be Resisim for more than 20 years. She worked as dig registrar and camp manager. She kept the dig accounts and she typed Bill's manuscripts. When Bill became first director of Jerusalem's Nelson Glick School of Biblical Archaeology, and later of the William F. Albright Institute of Archaeological Research, Norma helped him run these prestigious institutions. She hosted countless gala events in Jerusalem and later in Tucson when they moved here so he could um, assume his position at University of Arizona. Three decades after their divorce, Norma continues to type for Bill, and she says that the only difference now is that she gets paid for her work. So now let's return to the subject of women who direct field projects in the Middle East, a subject I've been researching for some years. Not long ago, I was assisted by Valerie Schlegel, a 2015 Judaic Studies graduate who just moved to Chicago to pursue a career in medicine. Oh, well. <laughs> um, the American Schools of Oriental Research, which Ed has also mentioned, it, mentioned and which we call ASOR, is the premier professional and learned society for archaeologists and tech scholars who investigate the ancient Near East. Founded in 1900, it has approximately 1,700 members. Full disclosure, I recently completed a dozen years as an ASOR trustee and Ed Wright now serves on its board. Since the late 1960s, ASOR dig directors have affiliated their projects with the ASOR's Committee on Archaeological Research and Policy. Although CAP's extensive records favor American and Canadian archaeologists, they are representative of the field at large. I quantified um, I quantified dig directors working in 14 countries across the Middle East and Mediterranean Basin and discovered that in the four decades between 1967, which was the earliest records I could uh, obtain, and 2006, only 18% of the 175 CAP affiliated projects had female directors. And they worked in only four countries, Cyprus, Israel, Jordan, and Turkey. Between 2010 and 2014, 33% of the 101 CAP affiliated digs had female directors, and now they worked in eight countries. One of them is um, Jenny Ebling, a fabulous UA PhD who studied with Bill Deaver, Ed Wright, and me and who now co-directs the excavation of Tel Jezreel with Israeli archaeologist Norma Franklin. Judaic Studies is proud to be a sponsor of the Jezreel Project. Just 
kind of as by way of background, um, Bill Deaver on your top, that's your left, and the other people are all of his 27 um, PhD graduates, people who received dissertations working with him. These are the people who have gone on in their careers to either direct or serve as senior staff on excavations in Israel. Again, the gender disparity is pretty obvious. But there has been an increase in the percentage of female dig directors or co-directors from 0% in the late 1960s when ASOR <coughs> began keeping records to just over 25% in the present millennium. The figures are hardly different for excavations in the Middle East that originate in Europe, nor are they much different when we focus on excavations that, um, only on excavations that take place in Israel. Israel is, of all the countries in the Middle East, the, one mo the country most supportive of women studying and working in archaeology. But even so, as Jenny Ebling recently reported in her blog post entitled, Where Are the Female Dig Directors in Israel? Um, of the 29 digs that were in the field in the summer of 2011, only eight, 28 percent, were Ex directed or co-directed by women. Furthermore, in excavations under the auspices of Israel's five major universities, men excavate the prestigious large tell sites while women direct smaller projects. Men also direct more than 70% of the digs that take place under the auspices of the Israel Antiquities Authority, something like the Park Service for Israel. There are many reasons why it is important for women to direct field projects. Dig directors are the people who make decisions about field strategy, publications, and more, and who allocate funding accordingly. In addition, they are the public face of archaeology, and in that way, they not only lead their profession, but also influence the ways in which the public perceives what is and what is not important. And of course, their status as dig directors enhances their success in fundraising and publications, thereby contributing to their professional advancement. When women are excluded from or underrepresented among the cohort of dig directors, both the study of antiquity and women's professional careers are negatively impacted. As I see it, the small number of women who direct field projects in Israel and across the Middle East offers one compelling explanation for why the investigation of women in ancient Israel and across Western Asia has been so slow to flourish. Women are not likely to direct excavations, but neither, of course, are most men. So let us consider the kinds of work that women commonly undertake within archaeology. What do they specialize in, and how does this compare to men's areas of specialization? Women are disproportionately in charge of artifacts and pottery, and it is about these subjects that they most commonly publish. The analysis and publication of pottery and artifacts is one of archaeology's most crucial tasks. At the same time, it is a time-consuming endeavor that can sidetrack professional advancement. While mastery of pottery and small finds can serve to advance the discussion of women in antiquity, in fact, it's essential for that discussion, it rarely facilitates the promotion of women into senior academic positions. Now let us look at publications and consider who publishes, who publishes what, and how this information helps us to understand women's professional status and advancement. A recent study by archaeologist Diane Bulger looked at articles published in 10 top journals in Near Eastern archaeology, and you can see the results here. Surveys and excavations, 81% published by men. Broad themes and hotly debated topics, 80% by men. Scientific analysis, 68% men. Artifacts, surprisingly, 68% men, and texts, mostly men. In 2014, Jenny Ebling and an, uh, a fellow archaeologist, Leanne Pace, studied ASOR's two archaeological journals, Near Eastern Archaeology and the Bulletin of the American Schools of Oriental Research. 
What they discovered was no surprise. In the 1970s, only a small number of women were published in these journals. By the 2000s, men were published as single or, or co-authors about twice as often as women. This decade, the statistics seem to be improving. So we'll come back, I don't know, five years from now and see how that worked out. In addition to the quantity of one's publications, an additional gauge of professional success is the number of citations of one's work that appear in other people's publications. This metric is new, kind of a product of the internet age, and its gender dynamics are only now beginning to be explored. Ebling and Pace determined that both in NEA, Near Eastern Archaeology, and BASOR, the Bulletin of the American Schools of Archaeology, Books and articles by women were infrequently cited. An even more recent study by um, sociologist Molly King and others um, demonstrated that while men cite themselves frequently, women rarely do. Of course, all this has an effect on those university positions that are held by female archaeologists. Inasmuch as not all academic positions are created equal, the greater the status of one's academic institution, the greater the probability of one's success in archaeology. This relates both to funding, which I'll discuss in a minute, and to securing licenses for archaeological fieldwork. Nowadays in Israel and elsewhere in the Middle East, the academic positions of foreign um, dig directors are scrutinized to ensure the quality of their credentials. This makes sense, of course, but it creates problems for women who are less likely than men to hold tenured positions in prestigious universities. Securing funding, especially external funding, is a metric by which academics in all fields are evaluated. For archaeologists, major grants are essential for launching, running, and publishing archaeological excavations. The National Science Foundation is one major funding source for American projects in the Middle East and elsewhere. At a 2014 workshop on women in archaeology held at the University of Pennsylvania, in which I participated, John Yellen, <coughs> Program Director for Archaeology and Related Research for the NSF's Directorate of, for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Science, Sciences, presented data on the funding of archaeological projects sorted by gender. I thank him for sharing his research with me. Here is data for two categories um, from fiscal year 2013, so doctoral dissertation proposals and senior research proposals. And you can see the um, discrepancies. In addition, according to Yellen, men are much more likely than women to apply for senior research funding very soon after receiving their doctorates. Although Yellen did not speculate on the reasons for this gender-related discrepancy, I suggest that it may relate to women's lower degree of confidence in their professional accomplishments and or to their childcare responsibilities. Not coincidentally, a 2016 study um, by three economists, Heather Antical, Kelly Bedard, and Jenna Stearns, looked at the consequences of maternity and paternity leave within the academy um, at universities. Their research revealed that women use maternity leaves to care for their babies, while men use paternity leaves to make progress on research and writing. The result is reduced female tenure rates and increased male tenure rates for faculty with um, young children. Now let us turn to women in leadership positions within ASOR, American Schools of Oriental Research. ASOR's contribution to Near Eastern Archaeology is exemplary and, it, and service in ASOR enhances our lives and our careers through work that we accomplish and through contacts that we make. ASOR's annual conference in November is the single venue in which, I want to say all of us, since that, but it's not, maybe that's an exaggeration, but an awful lot of us, regardless of where we're employed or excavate or do our research, are in the same place at one moment in time. 
a very long moment, like four days. My research indicates that women's access to leadership positions in ASOR mirrors what we have discussed with these other topics. ASOR was founded in 1900. Its first female president, Susan Ackerman, here on your right, um, of Dartmouth College, who briefly taught at U of A in the late 1980s and couldn't take the heat, began her term as ASOR president in 2014. By comparison, the Archaeological Institute of America, which is devoted to the field of classics, elected its first female president in 1965, while the Society of Biblical Literature elected its first female president in 1987. How, one wonders, could ASOR have been so far behind? To answer this question, I went through records dating back to 1919, the earliest year available. What I learned is that in the first six decades of the 20th century, only one woman served ASOR in a leadership capacity. Mary Indahasi was an Assyriologist who received her PhD from Bryn Mawr College. She was the first woman to study Semitic languages at the University of Leipzig, one of the first women to be admitted to the American Oriental Society, and she published extensively. Hussey taught at Mount Holyoke College from 1913 to 1941 and was the annual professor at the American School in Jerusalem from 1931 to 32. She was the first woman to teach there and for the next 30 years no other woman held an American School Fellowship. In what capacity did Hussey, an accomplished scholar and pioneer women, woman, contribute to ASOR? From 1917 to 1933, she was field secretary, a position that involved handling base or subscriptions and working <coughs> in some fundraising capacity. Later, she became president of ASOR's Alumni Association. Throughout this period of time, some 20 to 30 men served ASOR every year as trustees, executives, and more. A similarly detailed discussion of other women in ASOR leadership roles, but these slides point to some firsts. At the start of the 21st century, male trustees outnumbered female trustees approximately three to one. Recently, and partly because I've worked hard, I worked hard on this as I had a, the opportunity to um, develop a roster of people willing to run for the ASOR Board of Trustees, Recently, more women have been elected to the board so that the present ratio is three to two. ASOR has never had a female executive director. Before we leave the topic of women in positions of leadership, I want to mention Jerusalem's William F. Albright Institute of Archaeological Research. Founded in 1900 as ASOR's first overseas institute and known as the American School at that time, it was originally housed in the Grand New Hotel inside Jaffa Gate. Its stately new home, quote unquote, new home was completed in 1925. The Albright is the public face of North American archaeology in Israel and Palestine. Full disclosure, I'm an Albright trustee and Ed Wright served as the president of the board for many, many years. The Albright is renowned for its phenomenal library, its fellowships that bring international scholars to its hostel and small apartments, its lecture series, excavation tours, afternoon teas, and holiday events. It provides logistical support for North American excavations in Israel and Palestine, and it is the primary venue for contact among Palestinian, Israeli, and foreign archaeologists. Its director, currently Matt Adams, Dr. Matt Adams, and whoever its director is, is a luminary in the archaeological world, and these directors use the Albright as the base for their own excavation projects. While women have served and are serving as directors of ASOR's other two foreign research institutes, the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman, Jordan, on your um, right, and the Cyprus American Archaeological Research Institute in Nicosia, Cyprus, no woman has directed the Albright through its 116-year history. In 2001, 
In response to discussions on these and other related topics, Professor Timothy Harrison of the University of Toronto, who was then president of ASOR, established ASOR's initiative on the status of women, which I am honored to chair. Through the initiative, we are working to understand the concerns of women working in archaeology and to raise awareness and redress problems within ASOR and in the profession on our excavations and on our campuses. In the fall of 2012, I sent an email inquiry to ASOR's membership asking people to share their thoughts on the status of women in ASOR and in Near Eastern archaeology. Some 160 people, divided fairly evenly between men and women, responded. Here you can see their most frequent comments as they relate to archaeological fieldwork and to academia. One action taken by the initiative on the status of women is the establishment of an annual mentoring lunch, which has become a popular event at ASOR's annual meeting. It gives women an opportunity to meet informally and to make connections with other women who share their interests. This year's theme will be speed networking. Another project is an interactive map of women of ASOR developed by archaeologist Avivia Cormier. ASOR, use, ASOR women use it to designate their places of employment, excavation projects, professional websites, publications, and more. In addition to serving as a networking resource for ASOR's membership, the map facilitates the mentoring of ASOR's grad students and early career professionals. Hundreds of women have shared their information and become part of this networking enterprise. Another project that I am working on documents the extent to which archaeological fieldwork is or is not safe from intimidation, harassment, and violence based on gender, sexual orientation, and or gender identity. In response to a widely circulated survey over two years, I have received several hundred responses from people, two-thirds of them women, who live and work in some of the two dozen different countries uh, who live and work in some two dozen different countries and who have reported on their experience in almost that many countries in and around the Mediterranean basin. Their roles range from excavation director to undergraduate volunteer. Whether the problems they reported were physical or psychological, the perpetrators were commonly men in positions of authority on excavations or in the respondents' work settings, whether the respondents were grad students or faculty members. The consequences of this are profound. Not only are women's lives and well-being jeopardized, but so too are their professional development and their success. In addition to quantifying these problems by collecting data and listening to personal narratives, I am working to determine those factors that contribute to safe and unsafe fieldwork environments, to determine the best practices and the means um, by which to implement them, and to develop standards, policies, protocols, and trainings designed to educate and inform all participants on archaeological excavations about ethics and laws in the field and on research projects. Under ASOR's auspices, I am working to provide excavation leaders, staff, volunteers, employees, and members at large with access to helpful implement information and documentation. This implementation stage is surprisingly difficult. Having consulted with the University of Arizona Title IX specialists and study abroad staff, I have discovered that regardless of our own stringent code of com conduct on campus, and regardless of state and federal laws that apply on campuses throughout the United States, no policies or laws cover students or faculty who engage in projects beyond our national borders. This is among the problems that the new campus-wide UA Center for the Study of Prevention, for the Study and Prevention of Gender-Based Violence, with, which with I'm working, is trying to resolve. That's a brand new fledgling entity. You'll be, I'll be hopefully hearing more about that uh, later in the year. Let us finally return to the subject that began our discussion, that is, women in ancient Israel, and we will do this by considering the three major books about daily life in ancient Israel that were written between 1961 and the turn of the new millennium. Male archaeologists wrote all three and included women, if at all, 
only in discussions of social status and structure, that is, as wife, mother, widow, and so forth. What I find interesting is that in some newer books on daily life in antiquity, all written by female archaeologists, they all included women throughout, and they also managed to include men. Well done, guys. This brings me to my final point. Even today, it is most often women who undertake scholarship on men. Of the 11 articles in the most recent issue of Near Eastern Archaeology, all treating some aspect of gender archaeology, none relating to Israel, only three were written by men. I could give you statistics like this from now until the presidential debate ended. This is not a unique story here. It is mostly female scholars who study women in antiquity, despite the fact that there are no jobs for scholars who specialize in gender and women in antiquity, nor for those who specialize in the archaeology of women in the Iron Age. This means that people with these interests must specialize in something else and engage in research about women on the side. I conclude by noting that although the conditions for women in archaeology are better than they were in the past, parity and equality still remain goals. Concerted effort on the part of all of us in the archaeological community and in the academic community is needed to ensure that women have the same capacity to achieve their professional goals as do their male colleagues. Until this happens, I'm less than sanguine about the possibility of a full engagement with the lives of ancient Israelite women. But to end on a more optimistic note, um, the growing attention to women in antiquity, to gender studies, to household archaeology, and to the study of daily life activities together signal a sea change in our field, and it is one that opens great opportunities to learn about ancient Israelite society. Thank you.